Hello and welcome to GameSat. It's time to take a look at some more games that were never released outside of Japan in their time. It's been a year since I've done one of these episodes. But I've got an interesting set of games for a variety of different consoles this time. But keep in mind that interesting doesn't always mean fantastic or the hidden gem. It just means interesting. Anyway, let's begin. We begin with Salamander Deluxe Pack Plus from Konami on the PlayStation and Saturn. This contains three shooters, Salamander, Life Force, and Salamander 2. All of these are the arcade versions. The original Salamander here was cool in its time, and it's still lots of fun today. It's an offshoot of the Gradius series, but here the power-ups happen automatically like a normal shooter. I really like the primitive voices that talk to you throughout your adventure. Once you defeat a fearsome boss, the view changes, and now you're playing a vertical shooter. It's like two games in one, how do they do that? These levels are fun, of course, but they're just not as interesting as the horizontal levels. The change of pace is still nice, though. Beat the boss here, and it's back to being a horizontal shooter. Go to the right. The music is also primitive sounding, but it's very good, and it goes perfectly with the game. This game is super tough. It doesn't let you continue at all, so good luck. Life Force came out the next year. This is an upgrade to Salamander, DLC if you will. Here, you have the Gradius style weapon system where you collect things and then select your weapon once the one you want is highlighted. Some of the graphics have changed, both the enemies and the backgrounds. It even got a few new musical tunes here and there, but some of it remains the same. The voices return and there are lots of new ones here, though a few from Salamander are missing. I still love their cheesiness. No continues in this one either. Lastly, we have Salamander 2. This one goes back to the weapon style of the first Salamander game where you get what you pick up immediately. The graphics here have seen a huge upgrade, but you gotta keep in mind this came out 10 years after the first Salamander. There's lots of cool effects and transparencies all over the place. Yeah, even the Saturn version has the transparencies. Stupid Konami, this is all supposed to be an ugly dithered mesh. Many of the enemies and obstacles on the screen are pre-rendered, but they look quite good. I like how you think you're gonna fight a better looking version of the first boss from the original Salamander, but then it gets chomped up, and now you have to fight this thing. There's always a bigger fish. Oh, I can't believe I just quoted the Phantom Menace. The music also received a huge upgrade, and the voice now sounds like a real person. It does lose a bit of its charm in the process, but that's okay. You still have horizontal and vertical levels here, naturally. This one lets you continue if you run out of lives, and you don't get set back at all. Unfortunately, the game is quite short and super easy in comparison to the other games. However, once you beat it, you unlock Loop 2, which is more difficult and you can't continue at all. Overall, the PlayStation is the one to get over the Saturn version, even though the Saturn version is cheaper. That's because both Salamander 1 and Life Horse are squished horizontally on the Saturn. Here's the PlayStation version. And here's the Saturn version. The reason for this is that the Saturn doesn't have a low enough resolution for these two games and must draw their 256 horizontal pixels in a window 320 pixels wide. The PlayStation hardware has all of the resolutions. Stupid Sega! Salamander 2 is the same on both versions though, and they each feature thin black bars on the sides. The reason this one wasn't released outside of Japan is likely because it was 2D, and we were just too full of ourselves back then to appreciate 2D games when 3D was so new and exciting. Whatever, this is worth playing for sure. Twin Next up is Hisatsu on the Saturn from Emotion Digital Software and Bandai. It's based on a Japanese TV show about assassins. This is a 2D action game similar to Shinobi, only definitely not Shinobi. You begin by selecting two characters from a roster of four. Each has their own unique attacks as well as their own life meter. Two of the characters have longer range attacks while the others do their best up close. 
Each character also has their own unique special attack with the A button, which is usually longer range and stronger than their normal one. However, this eats up the blue meter on the top of the screen. Over time, this will refill on its own. You can switch between the characters with the tap of a shoulder button. You may need to do this in order to bust through certain barriers, which only a couple of characters can do. There are rice cakes here and there to help you restore some of your life. The action here is nowhere near as nimble as Shinobi. You have a crouching attack, but no high jump. You can't jump down from higher floors, and it's all fairly simple in its design. Sometimes I don't even notice that the enemies are behind me because I'm used to ignoring my other guy following me around, so I just end up being attacked. Yeah, that's how stupid I am. The stage design can be pretty rough, with leaps of faith everywhere and tons upon tons of stuff on the ground to hurt you. I tried the third stage here several times, but it didn't take long before I became bored and just turned the game off. The graphics are neat, and I love that they're in 2D. I also love the Western-style music that plays in the stages. Between the stages, there are lots of story scenes. Being that this is a licensed Japanese IP, it's no wonder it stayed in Japan. It's also 2D, which didn't help its chances of being localized anywhere else. Even if they were able to change the TV show tie-in, the gameplay doesn't hold up well enough to make for a very fun game. It's definitely interesting though, I just wish they had put more thought into it. Y'all like RPGs, right? Well, how about a big one that never came over? Well, the series was big in Japan anyway, which means that if you don't like it, you're nationalist? No, that's dumb. Uh, xenophobic? Yeah, let's go with that one. So you better like it. Here's Tengai Makyo Zaraya, otherwise known as Far East of Eden Zaraya. It's for the PC Engine CD from Hudson Soft and Red. This is an RPG, and I'm playing a translated version here, which was done by Lipemco. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but their work is much appreciated nonetheless. You play as Zoraya, a member of the Fire Clan. You need to unite with other members and defeat the bad guy Masakado and save the land of Japong. It looks a bit primitive on the surface with tiny characters and needing to actually select talk from a menu when you want to talk to someone, but it's definitely more advanced than the majority of RPGs of the time in many ways. For example, some townsfolk will have portraits when you talk to them. Some, but not all. The battles may remind you of the original Fantasy Star where it's in first person and you see the creatures in the backgrounds. These all look fantastic, and the backgrounds change depending on where you are on the map when the random battle triggers. Most of the enemies don't animate, unfortunately, other than shaking around. However, some enemies do have animation, and it looks pretty cool considering the technology of the time. Of course, all of the bosses, at least the ones that I've seen so far anyway, animate. And like pretty much any RPG, you level up with experience, only here it's called Virtue. This game requires some grinding, and one of the main issues, at least in the beginning, is that it doesn't feel like leveling up accomplishes a whole lot. Sometimes you may get an extra point for attack and defense, but usually it goes towards speed. You finally start making some good progress once you reach level 9. The battles happen often, and during them I usually feel pretty weak, but so far I've rarely died at all. Not that this game is super easy or anything. You can buy better items in the shops, but the good stuff is few and far between. You do gain certain party members and they can help a little in the battle, but they just kind of do their own thing. You might not even know that they did anything unless you carefully read the battle text. You also gain real party members who have their own levels, items, and weapons just like any other RPG. The battles definitely become more bearable once that happens, but it doesn't happen soon. You're probably not gonna get lost in this game, you just move from one place to the next in a pretty linear fashion. Now, lest you think that I'm complaining here, I am definitely not. The translation is plenty good enough to play through the game, and I imagine it sticks pretty close to the source material. It's a big no-no if you veer even a little bit off these days. The fans will eat you alive. Still, there's some humor that they were able to sneak in here. I am Kaku-san, and you are Kuku-san. <laughs> huh? Oh, that's not working designs enough for you? Well, how about this? Oh, still not enough? Well then take a gander at this. 
Seriously though, I think if this game were localized in its time, a lot of the names and places would be a bit more American friendly. And honestly, I don't think that would have decreased the enjoyment factor. Enemy names like Kitsune and the like just aren't very memorable. The game has some voice that comes up here and there for certain events, which is all done by the ADPCM chip. Speaking of that, most of the music here is done by the PC Engine sound hardware and not CD audio. This definitely makes the loading times faster. You do get used to playing a CD game with chiptune music, and the music is definitely appropriate, never bad. However, after a bit, I had to put my own stuff on because I did get tired of listening to the battles. I'm not saying that the battles have bad music, I'm just saying that I was hearing it a lot. But every time I got to someplace new, I'd put the game sound back on just to hear the new tunes. Overall, I still think this is a great game if you can get past certain aspects of it. I only got maybe four hours in before I decided to write this review, so keep that in mind. It's really too bad that this one didn't get localized in its time, but back then RPGs weren't very popular yet over here. Working Designs, or rather Gaijin Works, did try though with the remake on the Xbox 360. They got about 10% of the way through the translation, but couldn't meet Microsoft's required minimums for the title due to the lack of funding. And by the time they did have the money, Hudson Soft no longer existed and so they couldn't work with them. I talked more about this one in episode 360, Unreleased Games. Anyway, be sure to give this translation a go if you like old school RPGs. This one's called Melfin Stories, and it's for the Super Famicom from Sting and Assie, ASCII. This is a side-scrolling action game. You start out by choosing one of four characters who each have their own attack characteristics. L looks like a little kid and has the shortest reach with a sword attack. He looks stupid, and he probably is stupid, and generally I don't like using him too much. Horse is older and he has a spear. It's still fairly close range, but it's more satisfying to use than L's little sword. Lemon has the only projectile attack in the game. She's pretty fun to use. Finally, there's Nora with her Castlevania whip. I like her range, but I sure do wish the whip were faster. So yeah, each character is different, though none are what I would call nimble. I find myself using Lemon and Course the most. Of course, you bring down all of the enemies on the screen, but you also come across lots of treasure chests. These can have things that will help you out, but you gotta be careful because occasionally they will have something that harms you. There are also mimic chests to be aware of later in the game, but I like that when you kill them, they still give you some treasure. You can grab elemental magic and even store two of them. Use it to damage everything on the screen. They're not super powerful, but certainly better than nothing. You only have one life, but you do get a few continues. You can also earn more continues as you play the game. A couple of times during your journey, you'll be able to choose your route. You can select from hard or easy. Your ending will depend on your choices. But you'll only ever see one ending because you'll never choose easy, right? Only wimps do that. But seriously, this does add some replayability, especially since the game isn't tremendously long or difficult. You'll also encounter two different bonus stages, like trying to kill as many of these owl things as you can, or trying to completely obliterate the statue of the evil guy before the timer runs out. The graphics are quite nice, and they have some great color. The scrolling is usually well done, and even some of the bosses look pretty good. They use Mode 7 here quite a bit. I like how they made it look like sprite scaling here with the bad guys leaping towards you. Or how about this rotating bell that's swinging back and forth? As you saw earlier, the ground here has the typical looking Mode 7 apply, but the horizon background is also scaling towards you, which is something you don't often see like this on the console. However, I'm not hugely fond of how the HUD at the bottom literally takes up a quarter of the screen. The sound and music are a mixed bag. Nothing here is spectacular, but some of it is nice. Most of it is rather forgettable, though. Still, it generally fits the game. Overall, this isn't a spectacular title by any means, but it is worth a few playthroughs. There is an English translation for this one, but you don't need to know any Japanese at all to play it. I'm a bit surprised that this one wasn't released outside of Japan, as we got a lot of games that were much worse.
Now this next series did get released outside of Japan, well at least the anime series did, but they changed the name because I guess robots were popular at the time, I don't know. This is Super Dimension Force Macross from Bandai on the PlayStation 2. It was actually made by Sega, their AM2 team specifically. Now I really don't know anything about Macross or Robotech, so if you're a fan, do your best to bear with me and try not to let this review sting too much due to my ignorance of the source material. Anyway, you have a bunch of story-based missions that are all in Japanese, but you don't really need to know the language to play. It would probably help a little though. You pilot a jet called Valkyrie. It can fly around, shoot guns and missiles like other jets do. A large portion of the game takes place with these fly anywhere ace combat style stages. But that's not it, your jet can also transform into a robot. The fans probably would prefer it if I called it a mech though. This guy can walk around and mainly relies on his gun and he doesn't shoot missiles here. You also have a halfway transformed mode where you're a jet with arms and legs because that's a thing in Macross. The advantage here is that you can shoot missiles yet still be on the ground. Naturally, each of these modes have very different controls and they're somewhat different than they were in the tutorial I played. Don't play the tutorial. Still, the controls are all pretty good, except for the half-assed transformation mode as triangle moves you backwards and X moves you forward. The joysticks don't control your movement like they do in robot mode. Sorry, mech mode. Anyway, in the ace combat stages, you have about a thousand different enemies to shoot down, but it's not bad. You may notice what looks like little screen glitches as I'm firing the missiles. That's because after you lock on a certain amount, once you let go of the button, you can watch them fly to their target if you like. But you can quickly interrupt it so it just kind of flashes on and off real quick. It always tries to do this, but I believe there's an option you can click to turn it off if it bothers you. I really do like that there are different styles of play here, though I do think some of the Ace Combat ones are a tad long. But there's this one where you need to fly through all the asteroids before the time runs out. I didn't even notice the timer at first and I was just there dicking around and of course I failed. I was super eager to try again and naturally I succeeded. The missions on foot are really fun. This level features tons of other robots storming towards you and the best way to defeat them is by transforming halfway and drenching them with missiles. Oh man, it is so fun. There are some boss fights too and a couple of these I barely survived by the skin of my teeth. I was a bit confused back in the second mission as I killed off all of my enemies, a ton more came in. So I just kept killing them off for a while and then suddenly I failed. Well, it turns out when the second batch of enemies comes in, you need to work your way down to the ship. It says target, so of course I tried attacking it. I suppose if I were a Macross fan, I'd know better than to do that. They didn't mind though. You just need to land on it to complete the mission because it's a good guy ship. Anyway, I really like that it's not just a wash, rinse, repeat from stage to stage. Supposedly there's two campaigns in this one, one that follows the TV show and the other that follows Do You Remember Love? Now I have no idea what that even is, but I do know that there's a PlayStation 1 and Saturn Macross game called that which is currently being translated. Well the PlayStation version is being translated. They're trying to figure out the menus now I believe, but as far as I understand most of the rest has been done. Keep in mind that I'm making this episode like two months before you see it, so who knows, maybe it's done by now. Anyway, you can only choose one of the campaigns in the beginning. Graphically, this game looks pretty good for the PS2. It has a great frame rate, five times the frame rate of the anime series, and it's generally pretty sharp. It's even in widescreen. The music is fine, but I wish there were a larger variety of it as you play. Anime girls love to talk to you as you play, and boy oh boy do they have a lot to tell you. Someone should let them know that I can't understand them. And what's up with the full-on segment of this anime chick walking around doing things during this part? It actually goes on for quite a while. Maybe the pilot of this mech is remembering love. Yeah, that's gotta be it. I figured it out because I'm smart. This one would be great to have translated, but there's a lot to do, both text and voice. I'm guessing that's one of the reasons that it stayed in Japan. The biggest one is probably licensing, as I've heard that the folks that did Robotech in North America, which is what Macross was called here back in the day, didn't play nice with the original people. This game is still worth trying if you can.
This is Joy Mech Fight for the Famicom from Nintendo. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. If you've ever wondered why Nintendo has endured for over a century and is still thriving and loved today, well then, this title probably won't help you answer those questions. You play as a robot built out of several floating sprites similar to Rayman. This saves a ton of memory on animation, but I've personally never cared too much for this look. That aside, the game is very fluid. You begin by selecting the enemy robot you'd like to fight, which you can do before each match. You start out with one robot, but as you win fights, you get to keep the corpse of your enemy and inhabit them yourself to use in future matches. Both robots have three lives, and you get a little bit of life back when you deplete an enemy life bar. Once an enemy is down to their last life, the AI kicks into high gear and they become much tougher. Still pretty easy though. Each robot has a unique set of moves that you can learn and even test as you select them. They're not very complex, but that's okay. The NES only has two buttons after all. Up jumps and holding back blocks. After you defeat all of the robots, you unlock a Robo Ostrich to fight against. This was the first and only time I ever lost a match in the game. However, you can continue all you'd like. If you beat the game on hard, you can unlock some stuff. The graphics are alright, not the best I've seen on the console. I do like the parallax scrolling in the backgrounds, but unfortunately there aren't many of them. The music is fine, it certainly won't bother you. This game didn't get released outside of Japan because it was 1993 and 16-bit was already in its prime everywhere. Overall, this game is okay at best. Again, it's called Joy Mech Fight. I agree with the last two words in the title. This is Fushi no Umi no Nadia, or Nadia Secret of the Blue Water for the Mega Drive from Namcot. This is an adventure game based on an anime series which had 39 episodes and a movie. And as you can see, I'm playing a translated version here which was done by these fine folks. And you're gonna need it because there is a lot of text in this one. You play as Jean, a 14-year-old inventor in France. Right at the beginning of the game, a girl called Nadia runs past you and you go after her out of curiosity. She's trapped in an alley and you have to save her with your inventions, but she's not exactly grateful and takes off. The game is divided into chapters and after each one you get a password, there's no save function. Now keep in mind, this is not an RPG even though it kind of looks like one. There's no leveling up, no battles or anything like that. It starts out extremely easy, you just need to find the items and use them at the right time. It's all pretty simple to figure out. But the game gets more stingy with its clues as it goes on. Like the part in this cave. F this cave. You have to press buttons in this room and then find the door with the same colored button that it opens. If you fail, it's game over, and that means you need to do the chapter all over again from the beginning. And be careful, because some of these chapters can be pretty long. You eventually board a submarine, and you constantly need to travel up to the top and down to the bottom, which is not a quick process. Now, there is a move command which will let you move from place to place with relative ease. It's really nice. Unfortunately, it doesn't work at all on the submarine. I don't understand why. This game can still be enjoyable though, you just need some patience sometimes. Graphically, it looks fine for a 1991 game, maybe slightly underwhelming. I like this part where you can still be seen underneath the cover of the trees. And some of the cutscenes look pretty good, and there are plenty of them. The music does a good job, making excellent use of the FM. I imagine that this one stayed in Japan due to the anime being unknown to most people in the world at the time, and the heavy localization required probably didn't seem worth it. Now, I can't say that this is a must play for everyone, but if this is something that looks good to you, I think you should definitely try it. I'm glad I did. And there you go, more games that were never officially released outside of Japan. 
So would you have bought any of these in this episode had they been released in your area in their time, assuming you lived outside of Japan? And what are some other Japanese-only games that you feel should have gotten a wider release? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hey, are you in pain? Yeah, I have a foot cramp. You should eat more bananas. Ah! Well, why not try new fecal potassiumate? Fecal potassiumate? Fecal potassiumate, now with the power of 132 bananas in every pill. And what else? Fecal matter, which enhances the banana power. Mmm! Wow! My foot cramp's gone! Fecal potassiumate, the power of 132 bananas. And feces!